This is He Who Moans, Doctor Who Reviews. I only complain because I like Doctor Who and I care. And I overanalyze too much because, eh, whatever, it's just my opinion. So, unless you've been in space for a month, you'll know that season 8 starts soon. Also, if you're watching this, you'll know that I'm a cynical little dickhead likely to say things that will make people on both sides of the huge divide in opinion on Moffat either say that I'm being too nice or that I'm saying that Moffat is a bad storyteller and leave Moffat alone. No, really, I don't know why people think that. Like, I have made it clear that I don't think his recent work is by any means bad, right? Boring, stale and repetitive, yes, but not the worst thing ever. Though also I'm fortunately going to get lots of grown-ups watching my Season 8 reviews who recognise that all art is subjective to how it's experienced personally. If a decision taken by a writer makes sense to you, it doesn't necessarily make sense to everyone. There is always room for improvement in anything. There is never only one way of doing something. No one's perspective on why an episode of Doctor Who is good or bad, including me, you, and any bastard that watches it, is going to be able to speak for everyone. There is no such thing as a consensus of opinion on Doctor Who. Just because lots of people say an episode is good doesn't mean the general sense of agreement indicates anything. All I'm doing is watching Doctor Who like the rest of you and spending a video trying to explain why I did or didn't think it was entertaining to me. And if I do say stuff that you disagree with, fine, tell me so and let's talk about it and agree to respect each other's rights to an opinion. The people that recognise that are the best ones in case you couldn't tell. But since Season 8 is likely to be a controversial area for me to criticise given the level of hype and cynicism on both sides, I thought I'd offer some short, glib, facile comments on every episode of Doctor Who that our current exec producer, who, yes, is answerable to every decision made on a series before anyone starts saying those of us who draw Moffat's name into all criticism are out of line, yes, he is the one we should be talking about. I thought I'd look at all the episodes he's written himself. I mostly decided to do this to ensure that no one's going to project any sort of stupid anti Moffat agenda onto me, as that has happened before and it happens quite a lot, as lots of people in the Moffat camp tend to be hyper defensive. I should know, I was there a little while ago. You can go and watch my Moffat Month videos in which I dismantle precisely every single reason why my opinion on him has gone from this word to this word, but as we're about to head into season 8, I think complete episode by episode clarity is in order for any newcomers who can't be asked and want the bullet points. Also so no one's going to waste their time projecting some stupid vendetta onto me that I supposedly have and that I'm just jealous or something. I used to be in the Moffat camp alright, I'm not angry with Zira, I'm just disappointed with how it's turned out so far. This will be a long video and I know that runtime looks daunting so for ease of reference I've plotted my scale of opinion for you on a graph. I'm also only going to count minisodes if they actually stand out as a talking point and are over 5 minutes in length, so no there won't be much detail. Please feel free to leave your own graphs in the comments, and I will collate the data into a series of statistical analysis pie charts that we can present to Moffat in a case study. Let's start. Number 1. The Curse of the Fatal Death A loving piss take that comes from a place of loyal fandom. This was Moffat doing a greater service to the show than overcomplicated continuity explanations. Us fans ought to have a sense of humour about the show and its flaws, because as much as we love it, it is flawed and open to piss takes. And if we don't recognise that, then the writers will never be able to learn from their mistakes. And it is clear that this one comes from the right place. This is parody done for the right reasons. Number 2. The Empty Child and the Doctor Dances before the new show got too cocky and full of itself and fully developed its own style separate from the old show, Moffat wrote a creative, disconcerting, creepy World War II horror story with a bit of a cheesy ending but the characterisation was strong enough to get away with it. This was the episode that cemented Moffat as the frontrunner in the contest to find Russell's successor when the time would come. Number 3. The Girl in the Fireplace People's complaints on the way that Moffat writes women mostly stem from this one. He gets away with it here though because historically this is probably a realistic portrayal of Madame de Pompadour. Overall though, the story is one of Moffat's most imaginative and balanced great ideas with emotional weight. Unlike most of Ten's era, it knew its limits on angst and when it should do it and when it should shut up and get the plot moving. And it's also one of few Moffat tales that delivers a real gut punch at the end. One of his best. Number 4. Blink some minor things bother me about Blink. 
people that dislike it call them major things, but overall I felt its strengths vastly outweigh its weaknesses, and it does deserve its reputation. It's a tight, self-contained story, sort of more like a Doctor Who flavoured Twilight Zone story to me, though that probably mostly comes from the fact it's Doctor Light. Since his obvious rivals like Rob Shearman had mostly left the series by that point, this was the one that sealed the deal for the showrunner status. Number 5. Time Crash Short and inconsequential, but otherwise a really fun snippet of a story, featuring one of only two brief returns of a classic show Doctor. And while some of the dialogue's a bit hammy, it was a heartwarming bit of nostalgia, and you could tell that Davison was thrilled to be there, and that heavily bleeds into the story. It's a real pleasure to watch. Number 6. Silence in the Library and Forest of the Dead Retrospectively, I now groan every time River says something enigmatic about what we'd see in the future, but her character hadn't morphed into a walking set of overconfident, oversexual cliches by that point, and it's probably Alex Kingston's best performance to date. The story as well is really imaginative, and unlike lots of his later ones, the ideas all flow seamlessly together to make the story extra eerie, and at a lot of points, downright shocking. Number 7. The Eleventh Hour so, the Doctor starts the series by accidentally giving Amy some traumatic childhood memories and sending her to therapy. Uh, Twelve years. A cricket bat. Twelve years and four psychiatrists. Four. I kept fighting them. Why? They said you weren't real. Way to make an opening statement, Moffat. But still, it's an interesting approach to crafting a Doctor-companion relationship, as casting the Doctor as an imaginary friend brought to life. And the rest of the story is really fun and fast-paced, and while Moffat has a tendency to crowbar really unfunny jokes in all the time, I, I know, pot calling kettle black here, but, but the 11th hour gets away with it while keeping its pace and keeping you invested and interested. It also has a standout guest role from Olivia Coleman. Unfortunately, the 11th Doctor's era would not reach this height again. Number 8. The Beast Below Lots of people, including Moffat's children apparently, seem to dislike this one. I love it to bits personally, because yes, it is a stupid corny story, although I find it to be very reminiscent of the Graham Williams era. Some things about the plot are really, really stupid, and the reveal was kind of obvious and the politics stuff was very heavy-handed, but okay, there isn't much of a reason, but I really like this one. Number 9. Time of Angels and Flesh and Stone Before the angels lost their sting a little bit, Moffat took them and upped the ante as you knew he would. Time of Angels did a good job following up on Blink, in my opinion, and a couple of cool new things got brought into the mix with the angels. That which holds the image of an angel becomes itself an angel. Which, you know, makes sense if you think about it. Part 2 gets a bit overindulgent and nonsensical in parts, but otherwise it's a well-written self-contained adventure, and it feels to me like Moffat wrote this after having watched The Descent. Which you should too, in case you've never seen it. It's awesome. Number 10, The Pandorica Opens, and The Big Bang. The Pandorica Opens was the first episode Moffat wrote that I didn't really like that much. It is still good, and I see what it was going for, but the stuff where they were hiding in the crypt reminded me less of a creepy Hinchcliffe era story that was the intention, and more of an episode of Scooby-Doo. That and the ruthless killing machines who regard all other life form who aren't Dalek forming an alliance with all the other life forms it still bugs the shit out of me even now. I mean, I know that the Daleks have used other creatures to their own ends before, but... You propose an alliance? This is correct. Request denied. And yes, it's to get rid of their arch enemy, but... Yeah, this shouldn't work. I know, point me to all other instances of the Daleks working with other lifeforms before all you want. I don't care, it's always bugged me. That said, I did like the huge speech to the oncoming alien forces he gives. I could tell that Moffat really wanted to do this scene because he clearly got sick like I had of how often in the Davies era David Tennant would do that face and whine in which... I swear that the stage direction for that face was always written as the Doctor stares dramatically at character B for way longer than necessary over a plotty piano bit of the score. This speech was necessary in cementing who the Doctor was to me. The 80 or so that Matt Smith's Doctor did after this were tedious, though. But overall, this was the first one that I didn't really like that much. It was just okay. The Big Bang, however, was Moffat going speculative in a really interesting way. He has a great eye for freaky little details, like the Daleks in the museum exhibit here. There's just some wonderful little things in the Big Bang. It's kind of confusing in parts, but it makes sense on the whole, and it was really fun and imaginative, in my opinion. Number 11, A Christmas Carol. <sighs> I just really didn't like this one, like, at all. I'm sorry, people that like it, I just really, really didn't. 
I appreciate it for what it was, but the only thing I like about it, and the only thing that I remember about it, is the flying fish. Other than that, it's just another in a tediously long line of Christmas Carol derivatives, which, dear all media ever, please stop. There are enough versions of this story. A Muppet Christmas Carol has been made now. You will not outdo it, so please stop trying. Just outside of the context of it's Christmas, you have to like Christmas Doctor Who Stuart or you're a Scrooge, is this episode really that much better than most other episodes that we don't even hold in high regard, think they're just okay? Is it much better than those? Number 12. The Comic Relief Special, Space Time. I personally felt at the time that Comic Relief 2011 was a bit rubbish on the whole. I always tune in and give anyway, because hell you should, but I never expect much, and what Moffat delivered was even less than that. Outside of the central premise already having been done to death in Doctor Who's other media for decades now, all of the jokes in it were just so painfully unfunny that... Hey, Pond put some trousers on. <laughs> yeah, alright, Grandad. Yeah, I know it was just an irreverent bit of fluff, but even for an irreverent bit of fluff, it could have been a lot better, and it seriously pales in comparison to his previous comic relief entry, Curse of the Fatal Death. 13. The Impossible Astronaut and the Day of the Moon Again, Impossible Astronaut was another lull for me. While there's nothing wrong with the central premise, the murder mystery of the series would wear thin incredibly quickly. That and the silence, I really wanted to like the silence, I really, really did. They're an eerie looking alien, their presence alone is what makes them scary. And then Moffat flushes that down the fucking toilet by having them make a woo face and having them shoot blue electric lightning and explode people. Yeah, looking at them, and then knowing what they do is shoot blue electric lightning and explode people and go woo. Yeah, you really should have made their superpower be dropping banana skins, Moffat. Like, what the fuck were you smoking? Overall, though, the first part was really tedious to me. And yet Day of the Moon somehow made up for that. It was just such a deranged and bizarre second part that it just deserves applauding just for the experience, really. And while, yes, the foreshadowing was so annoyingly cack-handed, it was just such a weird part too that in spite of its flaws, I think it was fairly enjoyable on the whole. And yes, I know that some people get bugged by the Doctor's genocide at the end of the episode as the resolution, but what I say is, maybe this Doctor is the man who never would, but the Doctor, if you look at all 11 incarnations, he has a long history of not always being the man who never would who thinks that in some cases, sacrifice is necessary to save people, and he deals maturely with the consequences of those actions and grows as a character. It's not really that much outside of who the Doctor is. Number 14. A good man goes to war. Ploddy and predictable resolution to the river song Amy Might Be Pregnant arc aside, A Good Man Goes to War was an okay story albeit the Cybermen were kind of wasted on a plot that didn't really call for them to be there. They were kind of an interchangeable monster of the week again, like they usually are whenever they show up in New Who. I really wish someone would make them interesting again. And yes, that was bothering me throughout the entire duration, and yes, up to the ending, which I still hate. On the whole, A Good Man Goes to War kept a good pace and answered some questions, not all though, and frequently posed more, but it at least managed to keep me entertained up until that cliffhanger, which still bugs me even now. Number 15. Let's kill Hitler. The first half of it I spent thinking, okay, this could be interesting. Then the obvious happens and about halfway through the episode, what's her name regenerates into River and it all goes a bit pear-shaped for me. And for some reason, River's psychopathic now and she's the villain, I think, for some reason. I, I don't know, just we go into this episode expecting yet another Nazi parody thing, way to be original Moffat, and it's pretty good for what it is, but then just suddenly halfway through the episode it feels like Moffat fainted and started rolling his head back and forth across the keyboard in his sleep, and they went with whatever came out. Number 16, The Wedding of River Song. The fact the silence had basically been forgotten about for the entire series up until that point, and the relevance of all those mysteries that we set up at the beginning of the series was left as an open question ready for the finale, Wedding of River Song should have been where everything was tied together. And maybe it was for you, but it just felt like a rambling, incoherent mess to me. Just me, maybe, and we all absorb art in different ways, but if I can barely remember eight words about the plot, I just don't see the point, to be honest. This one just kept going on and on, and then this thing, and then this ties back to this thing, and then this thing, and then this thing, and maybe I don't get it, but here's the thing, I don't really want to. 
Don't get me wrong, I care about Doctor Who quite a lot, but I don't care enough to watch this more times to fully digest it, with someone putting a dunce hat on me and talking down to me about what it all means. Just, unlike most Doctor Who, I just didn't find this one entertaining, I'm sorry. Visually it's stunning, and Francis Barb was great, and the rest of the cast were great as always, and it's really well produced and well directed, but just, I didn't find anything in it interesting. It's not bad, just an indication that we now live in a world where apparently the word convoluted is a synonym for the word clever. As I've said before, my problem with Moffat is he's way more focused on being clever than he is on actually being fun. Number 17. The Doctor, the Widow, and the Wardrobe. This was where Moffat decided to focus on being fun, and what he did was create the crowning achievement in absolute shite. I was willing to give him the benefit of the doubt at the time because it was clear that he was working on quite a lot of other things while writing this one, but wow was it bad. And I was quick to point out at the time before I realised how utterly pointless arguing on forums was, if Russell had written this, we would not have put up with it as easily as people did. It's currently the only episode that Moffat's written that I can't think of anything I enjoyed about it at all. It was a great idea to get Bill Bailey and Arabella Weir and Claire Skinner, and the production team did a great job as they always do, but I'm just sorry, there's no getting past this script for me, and I just think it's an utter piece of crap. Easily the worst episode he's ever written, and my least favourite Christmas special, which, yes, that isn't saying much. And also, just to counter the people telling me that I was a Scrooge at the time, just because it's a Christmas special and meant primarily for children, doesn't give them a license to slack off and write such an emotionally manipulative, horribly derivative, unfunny, unimaginative, absolute piece of fucking drivel. Number 18. Asylum of the Daleks. And again, Moffat takes my expectations and stamps on them. This was the episode that launched me into talking about Doctor Who online back in 2012 because of how stunningly positive the critical reception was, and as pretty good as the idea was, it was just people being far too nice to Moffat with something that, again, if Russell's name was on this, it would not be given the time of day. Some pretty set pieces, yes, Moffat's Doctor Who looks downright stunning on occasion. It would just help if the story didn't play out as a Doctor Who-themed haunted house ride, with one of the most tedious romantic companion subplots that would have even made Russell go, oh, for fuck's sake, this is stupid, get the plot moving already. Even Russell would have said that. It also had one of the most mind-bogglingly predictable plot twists that I've ever seen in New Who, that I really don't know how anyone didn't see it coming a mile off. And for all Moffat's teases that we get to see some old Daleks again, they're on screen for about 20 seconds and are in a situation where they can't actually shoot and kill people, which I swear is one of the main things that you have to do if you're going to write a Dalek story. You have them kill stuff. 19. The Angels Take Manhattan This was another glimmer of hope among the mediocrity. I really like this one. The Statue of Liberty thing was a bit stupid, but overall, New Who does flat out horror stories so rarely now that I have to take whatever we're given, and it's a pretty decent one at that. Had some great ideas about it, the ending was a little bit nonsensical and cheesy, but overall, it didn't hamper it too much. I really like it overall. Number 20. The Snowmen. This is probably the best out of all the Christmas specials. But yes, that really isn't saying much, as the Christmas specials now have a tradition by this point of either being a bit bland or sucking quite a lot. It was a tad disappointing after all the talk for several years about a Christmas special featuring the return of the Doctor's deadliest and cuddliest foes, the Yeti, that the Great Intelligence make a return, and no Yeti. Overall, it was okay, pretty good, kind of forgettable and a bit boring at times for me, really. And when the episode I'm talking about is about killer snowmen, that's really saying a lot. Richard E. Grant was great, though. Number 21. The Bells of St. John. Yeah, this is one of those cases where I was far too nice in my initial review. I still think it's fairly solid on the whole. It doesn't make full use of its stupid Wi-Fi people premise that it could have done more with, and now I know that Clara basically acting like a walking brick the whole episode, and the following ones, come to think of it, had absolutely no relevance to anything. That's the thing with Moffat, he likes to distract us with teases about what he might do in the future so we'll shut up and stop complaining about the episode that's in front of our faces, which you can't expect a show to function entirely on empty promises. And that's precisely what Bells of St. John does, and if you do that, it won't have any lasting value when you watch it back in years to come and realise that what it teases about never amounted to anything. And when you actually dig through it, all you've got is a fairly decent, if tad forgettable, season opener. It's fairly good for what it is, and it's at least comprehensible, unlike lots of Moffat of this period, but otherwise it's just okay. 
Number 22, The Name of the Doctor. Retrospectively, the main reason I got so excited is because I thought it was a sign that Day of the Doctor would get more involved with Classic Who. I was wrong, it turned out. But I still think it was a fun story. The Whisperman didn't exactly have much to do except stand there and look menacing, but Richard E. Grant was great as always, and it was great to see some old Doctors again. It does do some stupid audience baiting about the Doctor's name, which we end up finding out was just a massive tease for the sake of it, but it was good for what it was. Also, this one does remind me that I should mention at this point the team of directors and cinematographers that Moffat's got working on the series do stunning work. I feel I wouldn't be doing them justice if I didn't at least mention that. Some of these episodes, including the ones that I adamantly dislike, look bloody magnificent. I just wish that some of the scripts were better. Number 23, The Night of the Doctor. Despite this possibly being the best eight minutes in the entirety of New Who, one of the major things that bothers me there were entire corners of the internet dedicated to discussion over whether we might finally see the Eighth Doctor on screen again. And from interviews, it seems like the only reason Moffat decided to do it is because we pressured him into it. And he wanted to complete the circle of continuity and show the Eighth Doctor's regeneration. And this is potentially the only thing we're going to get. And there doesn't seem to be that much enthusiasm among the high ups on the series to do anything more with the Eighth Doctor. I mean, I understand Paul McGann's explanation that he'd want to give a new Doctor a chance to shine first, which is admirable, but as a huge fan of his, you've just got to understand how frustrating it was that he wasn't in Day of the Doctor, and is potentially never going to appear on screen again, after such a stunning return that made Twitter explode on day of release. Though, from these eight minutes, he probably wasn't asked to Day of the Doctor because McGann would have wiped the fucking floor with Matt Smith and David Tennant. He's one of the best actors to ever play the Doctor, and here's an absolutely perfect eight-minute lesson in why. Number 24. The Day of the Doctor. Ooh, that can of worms again. Alright, I will accept people like it for their own reasons if they accept in return that I dislike it because of mine, and the stuff that I was thinking about it during it, which bothered me, and are detailed here. If it works for you, fine, I don't want to take that away from you, I just felt incredibly unenthused by it, on the whole, and felt that Moffat could have easily done something much more impressive and celebratory than continuity wanking, and offering me long explanations of why it works won't really change my opinion on it. Just because Moffat feels the need to serve continuity, that doesn't make me stop and go, wow, that means I have to like it now, that won't stop me finding it boring. No, seriously, I've had this conversation far too many times with people. Apparently because Day of the Doctor brings the Time War to a close and works within the context of itself, I'm supposed to think it's awesome. Before anyone tries to do it again, I've been given the lectures on why I don't get it and I'm a massive stupid face, but what those lectures all leave out is why I'm supposed to think Moffat explaining continuity is grounds for me saying it's brilliant and clever. I mean, maybe you're entertained by that, but I'm not really. Personally, I think it's just okay. Not great, but just... Call me a stupid face and say I just don't get it or you like, I could just never get into it. Number 25. The Time of the Doctor. Probably the first Moffat penned episode that I disliked where I didn't feel completely alone in my disliking of it. Finally, people like me were coming out of the woodwork saying that his recent work hasn't exactly been that brilliant. Finally, feeling unenthusiastic about Moffat Pen Doctor Who is no longer taboo in fandom. Feeling that he could do much more interesting things is no longer considered sacrilege. This is probably the main reason why I like Time of the Doctor more than Day of the Doctor, come to think of it. Oh, it's shit, yes, it's a fucking cavalcade of absolute wank and the very definition of a clusterfuck. And god, those nudity gags were just torturous to sit through. But it brought us all together, didn't it? Finally, loads of us were united in saying, after all that time, that was an incredibly disappointing end to the era, after everything that you'd set up. You really could have done something so much more impressive. So, there you have the scale of rise and fall with glimmers of hope in between, in my opinion, of Moffat Pen Doctor Who. It's not a bit of vendetta or, you're just jealous, Stuart, I just don't have Moffat tunnel vision anymore. And he's disappointed me a lot more often than I expected him to. And I just didn't find the ones that I said I didn't like entertaining, regardless of whether I got it or not. We clear on all this now, I'm just going to go into my Season 8 reviews and detail why I did or didn't find it entertaining. Deal?